Hey, I'm Drew, and you are watching or just listening to The Anxious Truth. The Anxious Truth is the podcast where we talk about all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and anxiety recovery. So if you're having problems with things like panic attacks, agoraphobia, OCD, or health anxiety, you're in the right place. This week, we're going to have a chat with an old friend of the podcast about that thing where you get triggered by a story in the news or you see something actually happen that confirms one of your fears. So let's check it out. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is podcast episode number 233. We are recording in early November of 2022 for those of you who are listening in the future. Today, we are going to talk about the power of suggestion and scary thoughts. This is that thing that happens when you see a story on the news or maybe a celebrity does something or you just witness an event in real life that triggers you and confirms those things that your lizard brain is always really afraid of are really scary. And so you get a little bit freaked out by it. So today's podcast episode is about the power of suggestion and having scary thoughts and about how really normal that is in this community. My guest today, I'm joined by a secret special guest. I'm not going to tell you his name. We'll wait till he gets on camera with me. But if you were in my Facebook group for any length of time, you will recognize this person. Uh, he's now a friend of mine, uh, somebody who I know really struggled with panic disorder and agoraphobia for many years, and now would probably call himself, I won't put words in his mouth, but probably 80 or 90% recovered and living a great life. So it's kind of an informal chat between friends. This came up for him last week. He called me, said, hey, this would be a good podcast episode. And it is. So before we get to the interview, just a quick uh, sponsor note. This week, we are sponsored by Dr. Magic Finger once again. This is Dr. Magic Finger's Anxiety Pens, special pens for anxiety. So the way this appears to work is that the ink is infused with good vibes, and the little bolt action piece of the pen that operates it, I believe, is made in a community of shamanistic healers. So when you can use any old pen if you want, but when you use the special Dr. Dr. Magic Fingers anxiety pen, then the anxiety runs out of your head into the ink and then out onto the page. So when you make a shopping list or you write an angry letter to your electric company because you hate them, all your anxiety just leaves you and it goes out through the ink and onto the paper and then you're better. So Dr. Magic Finger comes in this cool brass color, which develops a patina, and I'm all about that. So yeah, Dr. Magic Finger, always coming through to sponsor The Anxious Truth, or not, because clearly at this point now you know there is no Dr. Magic Finger, and I'm just having fun with these silly little things. I get tired of it sooner or later. The Anxious Truth is actually just sponsored by me, and all the stuff that I kind of have for you guys free and otherwise is on my website at theanxioustruth.com. So go check it out. There are books. There's a monthly webinar on distress tolerance that I do every month with my friend Joanna Hardis. There's a free one-hour anxiety one-on-one video workshop. There's my free morning newsletter called The Anxious Morning. There's all the other podcast episodes. There's my social media stuff. There's all kinds of good stuff. So go over to theanxioustruth.com. Check it out. And uh, all the ways to support the work are also there, financial and otherwise, theanxioustruth.com slash support. That is never required, but always appreciated. I appreciate any way you guys support this work and encourage me to do more. Thank you very much. Let's get on to today's topic, which is the power of suggestion, being triggered and having scary thoughts. And uh, I can't wait to see who's on today. It's going to be good. I'll come back at the end to wrap it up. See you in a few. Really? Anyway, um, so welcome, Jay. Hey, Drew. How are you? I'm very good. For those of you, I, I mentioned it in the intro, but I kind of teased it as we have a special guest. For those of you who have been in my Facebook group for any extended period of time, you will recognize Mr. J. Floyd here. One of the one of the greatest human beings that I'm aware of today. Oh, now I'm just... Okay. Just, just a good dude. Yeah. Uh, Jay was one of the admins in the Facebook group who gave generously of his time until he became one of the smartest human beings I know and left Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> and I just left Twitter too. Oh my, you, you're must be, you're living the dream now. I decided I don't, I don't need to know what an unbalanced chicken farmer thinks of my thoughts. <laughs> That's fair. That's yeah. It's probably accurate yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of that, anyway, Jay and I speak on a regular basis. I'm proud to call him my friend. And we had a great conversation the other day. We said, this is a podcast episode. Actually, I give you full credit. You said, this is probably a podcast episode. So yeah, it hit me the minute I saw it in the news. Yes. So we're going to talk about today, and you get a chance now to just literally you just eavesdrop on a conversation between two guys of questionable humor and intelligence, and hopefully it'll be useful to you. But Fair. Jay called Fair. me, and Fair. what happened? Explain what happened, and then where you were at the moment, and we'll kind of get into it. People are going to get this. I know um, they will. 
I'm going to not use the celebrity's name. People That's will know who it is, but I just don't want to exploit it. It's like, um, you know, I, one of the hangers on issues for me in my recovery, cause I'm like 90% recovered, I think. Yeah. That's somewhat arbitrary, but mostly recovered. There are just a couple of areas that are still sticking points. And one of them is driving on the freeway, less so around town, but driving on the freeway has remained an, uh, a, a stubborn problem for me. Um, so a driving phobia, uh, driving anxiety. Mm -hmm. And then um, last week, uh, a much-loved celebrity died in a car crash. And um, the immediate report said, and of course, those of us with um, anxiety issues have a different antenna and we pick up different things than other people do. People without anxiety didn't notice this part of the news story. But the line that said, it's believed that he had a medical issue while driving. Yeah. And I just went, well, I mean, a word I'm not going to say on your podcast. Mm, <laughs> F you. Yeah, yeah. How dare you? You just completely revved up and triggered a word I don't particularly care for, but we'll use here. Yeah. You just triggered thousands of people, probably more. Yeah, um, because the fear is the big what if the obtrusive thought that happens for anxious drivers is even if I do everything right, what if my body goes kerflooey? Um, you know, and I take out myself and at least four people, three of whom probably didn't deserve it. Sure. Um, um, OK, I'm just waiting for that to register. <laughs> but one clearly did. <laughs> I'm condoning the death of a bystander. And I was just sort of waiting for I know you're a New Yorker, but yeah, you, yeah. You, you could at least. I, I, still, I have a little bit of compassion left in me. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, that's my parrot in the background. Hey. He was just clicking at us. If you hear vulgarities coming from over my shoulder, it's my parrot. Oh. And on cue, she just did it. I don't know if you heard that. No, it, was, um, it was not intelligible. But it's okay. I don't promise it's a family friendly podcast. It's okay. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. good. Um, so, so I saw that and I thought, oh, let, let me see how that affects me. But I know that people who are not as far along in recovery, that's going to. I'm not going. Well, the Claire Week setback. It's not going to be a setback, but it's going to be something that nags at them. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a bullet in the gun of the bad guy. Of yeah. the obtrusive thoughts. Um, well, if it happened to that celebrity, who's to say it's not going to happen to me? And and so I I noticed over over the last few days since we talked about it and, and considered bringing it up on your on your show, mm -hmm. um, uh, I I've been sort of paying attention. Yes, I'm a tiny bit more hyper vigilant in my overthinking while driving around town. Mm -hmm. um, a tiny bit more. I started noticing it. Also, I live in LA and I happened to drive very close to where it happened. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, it got worse when I got close to where it happened. It's fascinating. That's the, yeah. the magic of anxiety and the magic of the brain. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so I wanted to bring it up as, you know, what do you do with that? Like in your studies, I mean, in your experience, mm -hmm. what are you hearing is a good way to, to recategorize those thoughts. Um, I, I think, and we talked about this a little bit when we had our phone call the other day, to me, it comes down to, it's a risk assessment problem or like a life math problem that I, I like to use the word life math. And I think for a, a regular air quotes, regular person, maybe that one in four that you mowed over and didn't care about that person <laughs> understands that there's a risk associated. It could be that person. I don't know. But um, sure. that person understands when they hear that news story, the celebrity unfortunately passes in a car accident and was probably the victim of a medical incident that caused this problem. And okay. it's come out since then that that's confirmed. That's confirmed. Okay. So yeah. when when a, a normal or regular person hears that, they do register some amount of risk. Like I, I hear that and I think, well, I, I know how old I am. Like I'm not getting any younger. Like, you know, that that's possible. So – that thought creeps into every human mind if they if they're paying attention, right? If they're paying attention, if they hear it, that thought will creep in. But the level of risk that gets assigned to that variable day to day is pretty low. Like, okay, my odds of that happening are higher now than they were in 1986. That's true, but there's still it goes in these with with non disordered thinking. Correct. It goes in the something to know bucket 
rather than something to be terrified of. Fuck it. That's exactly right. So the person who is still dealing with a disordered level of anxiety will take that risk variable and pump it way up, right? Like, Mm -hmm. this is the thing I'm afraid of. It's scaring the hell out of me right now. So therefore, it must be important. So I must assign it a risk value that's 100 times higher than the risk value that Drew gives it. So You know what? What do you think of this? Something I did with flying, which now I will tell you, I just took a trip on an airplane across the country uh, last weekend. And um, I now have zero flying anxiety, yeah, none, not, zero, zilch, yep. completely gone, completely cured. Yeah. And I, I'm like, and that was, trust me, it was intense when it was here. Mm-hmm. I'm talking, uh, popping it out of van to the point where I worried about my respiration uh, on a plane. That's yeah. how bad it got. Um, but now gone, completely healed. Okay. One of the, one of the, um, uh, thoughts that I had in that recovery process would probably also be useful here. Mm-hmm. And it was helpful for me when I was in the problem, when I was in the, when the disorder was driving my thoughts, Yeah, I would go, okay, Jay, this is a risk assessment problem. I didn't have that language at the time, mm-hmm. but how many people fly a day? Oh, geez, millions. And given on a daily basis, how many people die in a plane accident? Yeah, not and zero. the answer on most days is zero. Correct. Um, and and really looking at it from that perspective, I could do the same thing here. Living in Los Angeles, how many people are on the road right now? Oh, how many of them will die today in a car accident? And you could even pull that out. How many of them are going to die in a car accident in their lifetime? How many people are going to have that as the cause of death? And the answer is 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 minuscule numbers. Correct. It's, it's not. It really isn't worthy of the energy that the anxious people give it, uh, statistically speaking. But the issue there, and you're 100 percent correct that it, that is correct, and that's why somebody who is in a non disordered state can take that risk variable and shrink it to such a small. It's negligible, right? I remember being that person and it literally sounded like this. Ooh, wouldn't that be awful? Yeah, that would suck. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like you, you literally, that's literally that's, and and it doesn't cross my mind again. Yeah. Yeah. That might suck a little bit. The anxious mind is really sticky. Well, the anxious mind, and it's very much the same, whether or not you're afraid of driving or you have heart anxiety or whatever it happens to be, or you have health anxiety. I've talked about this. Health anxiety is, is an uncertainty and tolerance problem, but almost all of this is right. So if the odds are greater than zero or your certainty of safety is less than 100% intolerable, I'm sorry, intolerable. It's true. You could fly tomorrow. The odds are dramatically against you dying in a plane crash, as we have demonstrated, but the odds are not zero because, you know, 200 people every five years die in plane crashes. That's true. I mean, you know, and I know that I will obviously die in a plane crash, but it will be because a plane crashed into the Seven Eleven where I was getting a Slurpee. <laughs> this is and a strange twist of fate. going to be what kills me. <laughs> uh, but, oh, I have this, you walking out and doing the, oh. Oh, <laughs> oh are you fucking <laughs> Boom, that's it. Um, uh, yeah. Call bro! <laughs> um, oh. the, um, but the, um, um, so, Drew, maybe a tip or a trick yeah. um, that you could offer from your studies and your experience. Well, um, so that moment happens in the news. Yeah. Give me the next hour for the anxious person. Oh, the next. I mean, I think you experienced a little bit of it and you were, you know, when you called and talked to me about it, which I think was great. I'm glad you did. Um, I think the next hour for a lot of the people listening to this podcast will be spent in a really agitated, uncomfortable state feeling like they are in some sort of danger Their baseline will go up way up because this thing that I harbor as a fear, as a feared outcome is now real. Like I have just been reminded. It's a big C. C. I told you I'm not crazy. That's and exactly right. All of us is, well, yeah, you are, but in a really common way. And in a very specific, <laughs> right. It's a specific kind of crazy that we were it's okay so, with. Yeah. And we all have to a certain extent, but Yes, you're absolutely right. Your lizard brain, if you will, is going to do that whole, like, told you, told you, see, told you. See, see, This happens, right. And so I understand that. So that next hour is going to be spent in a really elevated state of discomfort, agitation, fear. Maybe that looks like talking about it, asking for reassurance. In the Facebook group the other day, I had somebody post a video of a woman fainting. I told you about this on our call. It was some news thing. I don't know. Woman anchor faces her greatest fear and faints on the air. It was a a sensationalized clickbait crazy thing, but this person's fear is fainting. 
So they saw this video and immediately had to post it in the Facebook group. What do you think? Drew, what do you think of this? Same thing would happen, generally speaking. Let me ask my partner. Let me ask my friend. Let me ask my sister. Let me ask Drew. Let me ask Jay. Did you see that story? What do you think about that? Because and looking then, for the assurance for those, that it won't happen to you. I promise, Jay, it won't then, happen to you. <laughs> yeah. Then for people who are have any recovery under their belt comes the guilt or shame about having indulged the fear. I think we need to let people off the hook on that. Oh, oh what happened? And plug my headset. I hate when that happens. Oh, um, I do. I, I would agree with you 100%, and I'm so happy that you brought that up because so many people will get down on themselves. Some I'm failing, like, recovery isn't yes, working. Yes, it's not it's working. Not enough of this for it to ever really work for me. Right. This is the dialogue that can be set off. Yeah, and I think I know you've experienced that, and you're always so open about talking about it, and I appreciate that. But you can you can let yourself off the hook. It's okay. Like we all, and I say this all. I started time. looking at it as a continuum. It's a continuum. Yeah, that's exactly right. And to me, and we had a great conversation not too long ago about this too. Like the resiliency time. And I did all kinds of crazy math on, on my Instagram. Anybody who saw that, I'm still, it's still here. That's coming. I'm telling you. But we talked about that. It's the recovery time. So when you're in the midst of it, the thick of the struggle, when you get triggered, air quotes, by this story about a celebrity, or you see fainting on TV, or, oh my goodness, my mother-in-law fainted last week. She's also very ill. But I see that fainting as confirming my worst fear that I might faint too. The time it takes you to go from, heightened, agitated, terrified state to back to normal baseline, the more recovered you are, the faster that happens. Exactly. That's how I look at it. Yeah. Because I don't, my goal used to be zero problems ever mm -hmm. because the problems were so awful. They felt so bad. Now it really becomes a, oh, I indulged that for 30 minutes. That used to cost me a week. Yes. Love that. Um, and that, that to me is just recovery 101. That's, that's, those are the mileposts, yeah. the, the signposts and show you how far you've come. I agree 100%. And that realization, like that used to cost me a week. That's a really accurate statement. That literally would cost you a week of your life. So, Absolutely. And I was and telling now I have like a vigorous intolerance for acting in accordance with those fears. Well, because I you recognize like them. Really. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, I have a big, uh-uh, no, you... I can feel however I feel I'm doing the thing anyway. Yeah. Like uh, last night I had to go pick up a friend and it was night driving in LA and you know, LA is filled with zombie maniacs that want to eat your face. Yeah, of course. I don't know if you've seen this. And so I try not to go out at night <laughs> because of that. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. But I, I just, I'm like, nope, doing it no matter what. I don't even indulge the not doing it thought for very long anymore. Yeah. So a good, I think a, a good indicator of how far you are along in this process is, how soon does that cri that crisis, if you will, a psychological crisis, end for you? That it, and that's, you might what, still that's what I want. Think that's about what I want it. your people to hear. Yeah, is no, no, no. Not having anxious, immediate responses to things mm -hmm. isn't the goal with recovery. No. And I've started saying to the people that I work with, not professionally, but anytime I hear someone who I know is in disorder, yeah, I'm like, I will, I will, you can use me as your safety person for a couple of months, yeah, until you start getting the basics under you, yeah, because you need that at first. And what I will say to them is, it's hard for you to hear right now, but if you have anxiety and it doesn't matter, does it matter? <laughs> and it makes them go, huh? If you have anxiety and it doesn't matter, is it a problem? Yeah. It's not. It's yeah. not a problem. Human beings are supposed to have anxiety. Yeah. It's what keeps us from hang gliding over volcanoes. Well, I, I do that. I just did it this morning. <laughs> but, you know, all the Long Island volcanoes that we have here. But oh, I, yeah, both of them. I think it's important to understand that that is 100% true. So the, the fact that you might get triggered by the power of suggestion, which is what we're talking about today. You might have a bodily response to something fearful. Correct. Yeah, because that may be a fear that you harbor for the rest of your life. Hey, look, and I say this all the time, I don't know anybody more recovered than me, but there are moments when I can still have an uh-oh thought. Like, and, and But the difference is I might experience seconds now of distress, a minute, two, maybe. Maybe I'll have a full-blown panic attack that lasts all of 10 minutes now. That might happen once or twice a year. But the recovery from that and the snapback is so fast. And the meaning behind those unpleasant moments mm -hmm. for me is no longer 
see, your life is over. Right. Right. It's just that used to be the response. I lived that way for eight months to a year. So that that reaction or the having that thought was a dis- that was the disaster. See? Yeah, my life's over. I can't do I can't accomplish any of my goals. Everything that I wanted to do in life is now over. If I haven't done it by now, I won't be able to. That was literally where my mind used to go. And this was this was starting up to the time that I I discovered Claire Weeks and that led me to discovering your Facebook group. Yeah. Um, that was how, that was the gestation of my recovery yeah. and, uh, well, the timeline I should say of my recovery. So, but it, even once I started getting some of the principles under me that you lay out in your book and that you talk about on your podcast, you know, the minute, even then I still struggled intensely for three or four months mm-hmm. and it's, but, and, and by the way, the recovery process for me and for a lot of the people that I talk to, it isn't something you notice. Um, in the moment, it's something you notice later and you go, Oh, that used to bother me. That is totally the way you start noticing that you've recovered. Yeah. If you're listening, um, you can't see the big smile on my face because that's true. Yeah. It's so true. It's just true. It's just true. It's not like, yay, I recovered. I just noticed. It's like, I haven't had that feeling in a while. Right. When- oh, wait a minute. That feeling used to stop me from going to the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah. And so people ask all the time, when, how do you know when you're recovered? Well, y- you don't until one day you realize, oh, oh wait a how minute. you know is eventually. That's how you know. Right. And, and, and you stop asking. Yeah. Like that, that question stops being a question at some point. You just stop thinking exactly. about it. And then one day you realize, oh, when did that happen? Like, wait, when did I become a grown up? Like, I still have that thought yeah. and I'm still, I'm still waiting. <laughs> and I just love, I love <laughs> the essence of what we were talking about here, which is, there are going to be moments in the real world that confirm your worst fears. Yeah. Well, because it, it is true, and we can acknowledge this as we start to maybe wrap this up a little bit. Let's acknowledge that unless you have, and there are truly completely irrational fears. Gravity will turn off is one that seems to come up a lot now. Gravity will not turn off. That is a comp- if you, I gained so much weight, I would welcome that. Yeah. You know, if they, we could make that happen partially, I'd be all right with that. <laughs> I'm good with like a 4% reduction gets me to my ideal weight. So I think, yeah. Um, yeah, if we can do that, but there are truly irrational fears that are impossible. A panic attack does not make you psychotic. Gravity would not turn off and the moon will not turn into meatloaf. But many of the other common fears are grounded in things that really do happen. People do have heart attacks. They do get mentally ill. They do die. They do embarrass themselves. That is true. And you will be triggered by a demonstration of that. That is the world telling your oversensitized brain, see, this can happen. I even did with the, what if I shit myself at the grocery store, yeah. which I had all the time. Yep. I have, even that eventually became, I will be laughing about that with a friend on the phone within 30 minutes. Yes. Or like, well, that would really suck. I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, no, no. And I, it would become a funny, horrifying story in my life. Yeah. And it used to be like the end of the world. Now it's like, no, it'll just become a funny story if that were to happen. Yeah. And if you are being um, triggered, the power of suggestion is working against you right now. Just understand that it's okay for that to happen. Recognize what's going on right now. I'm, I'm indulging this crazy life math, uh, you know, out of whack one risk of, assessment one and step of, away from it for a second. Just be afraid. One of the moments that I... One of the angriest I ever got with one of your podcasts was one of your early ones when you said, let it kill you. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, oh, why do you hate me? And it has now become a touchstone of my recovery. (laughs) Why do you hate me so much, guy that doesn't even know me? This is an interesting, and I I can't think it kind of dovetails with it. I think the very first interaction that Jay and I ever had together was a little bit of a confrontation because you were taking exception to some of my words. Yeah. And I think it was like in a YouTube comment, like, well, it's such a shame that you would say something like that. And I believe. Yeah. yeah, Here we are years later. Yeah. I did get over it. (laughs) Oh, me too. I mean, I'm not harboring any (laughs) flake as I hang up on Jay. I'm not harboring any resentment over that. No, no, really. It's true. That's super common. You will think that these things, if you are triggered by some story here in the news or something you see in the world, it's normal. It's going to happen. Recognize what's happening. And the best you can do to like to put that, that trick or that tip into this, recognize my lizard brain is oversensitized. It is dramatically overestimating the amount of danger I'm in right now. So I'm just going to have to be really afraid for a little while. Without and, trying to and, stop that and, and figure this out, sensitization is like a gyroscope. Yep. 
it gets going really fast and it takes a minute to slow down. Right. Definitely. And I even had to use that after my trip because I went to an amusement park. There were some genuinely scary things that got me a little more sensitized. Yeah. So yesterday, once I got back into my routine here in Los Angeles, I had to go, oh, oh, I'm a little sensitized. And that's just going to slow down gradually. And today it's less and tomorrow it will probably be gone. Yeah. I so. love that, that it takes a while to spin down. You, you know, There's no instantaneous, and that's it. You're done with it. So. Yeah. Give it time. Let uh, it unwind. Be afraid if you have to be. Just don't try to stop. Give it a breath, if you will. Give it a minute. It'll work itself out. Great topic, my friend. I'm glad that you called with this one. I'm so glad that we did this. It's so good to see you, Drew. Yeah, we'll have to do them now and then. You know, not that Jay is is involved in the mental health field at all, but can we talk about your show or no? Is that a sub? Is that a... uh, You can talk about anything. I have no secrets. I mean, like, I can get so descriptive about being a homosexual that you'll be uncomfortable. (laughs) Oh, Okay, well, we'll test that theory at some point. <laughs> Challenge accepted. But okay, I, I think, because um, I think it's great. In the end, and you said, you know, some of that, that crazy thing that would happen in your head, like, see, I'm never going to accomplish the things I want to accomplish. This is a guy oh. who, yes, this is a guy who went from that to now, I think it seems I to be have, moving along pretty nicely, your show. I have written a, yes. um, uh, a stage musical. Yeah. That was adapted from a movie I made in 2006 that went to Sundance. Mm-hmm. I wrote the book and lyrics to it since my recovery. Yeah, I had last December, we had our first stage reading at a venue in Hollywood with 200 people in attendance. And I, I now I did at one point during the day of tech rehearsal when the audience was going to be there in four hours. Mm-hmm. I turned to my co-book writer and I said, I'm unpleasantly anxious. <laughs> and he said, we can tell. And. That was it. It went off. It went off perfectly. We got what we needed out of it. Uh, This is a person who couldn't go to the grocery store without enormous fear. Yeah. Literally two years before that. Yeah. So, so uh, imagine that life, that, that your life is not over. Your life is in a period of difficulty Yeah. and this difficulty is manageable. Yeah. And every single time I see another YouTube video, another song from the show hitting the airwaves, it just makes me smile (laughs) that much more. Cause first of all, they are brilliantly written. And this is a guy who's a Broadway guy. Oh, a hundred percent. Just the humor is spectacularly smart and the music is great and everything. I'm really happy with it. And by the way, I'm currently working on a new one that is, very, very different with a different composer. So, like now, I'm working on my next one. Amazing. And I, I, this, all this from a person who was certain his life was over. Yeah, uh-uh. and a person who was <laughs> triggered by a, a, a news story about the unfortunate passing of a celebrity about a week ago. And here Both we are. Things are true, right? Both it's all things good are at true. the same time. Yeah, very good, Jay. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate Thank you, man, you in a big way. Thank you so much. All right, we'll see you guys. I'll wrap it up in a minute. All right, folks, we are back to wrap this one up. Not a whole lot to say about that. Hopefully it was informative. I love when Jay comes on and shares his experience. We haven't done one of these in a couple of years. We did a driving anxiety one, oh, about two years, two and a half years ago. So you guys might want to check that out. I'll link it in the show notes. So if you go to theanxioustruth.com slash 233, I'll link the other episode that Jay and I did together. It was about highway driving anxiety, if I remember correctly. And it was also another good one. Jay's just a good guy. He had a lot of good to say about this. And again, remember, if you get triggered and you're having scary thoughts because of the power of suggestion, that's totally okay. It's part of this process. Recognize what's happening. Recognize when your anxious fear is distorting the threat level. And then just let it be there. The biggest issue is not that it happens. The biggest issue is that you begin to dig into it and try to solve the problem, either by proving that what you saw won't happen to you which you may never be able to prove because of that uncertainty problem in life, or at least understanding that I don't have to try to solve that problem and I don't have to try to make myself feel better. Let it play itself out, engage with life as we always talk about, and just let it pass. And as you go down the road, that crisis moment will get, will last shorter and shorter and shorter amounts of time, like I said, and like Jay has confirmed in his life as well. So that is it. Episode 233 in the books. You know it is over because there's the music. That is Afterglow by my friend Ben Drake. It is the sound, the song that you hear at the beginning of most podcast episodes, at the end of every podcast episode. If you want to check it out, you can find out more about Ben and Afterglow at his website, which is bendrakemusic.com. If you are listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or some platform that lets you rate and review the podcast that you listen to, leave a five-star rating if you like this podcast, and then maybe take a second and write a review if you dig it, because it helps other people find the podcast and we get to help more people, which is why I do this. 
If you're watching this as a YouTube video, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so that you know when I upload, like the video, and leave a comment that I can respond to. Uh, you know, we have to soothe the uh, YouTube algorithm gods. So thank you for your help with that. That's it. We're done. Hopefully it's been helpful. We will see you again next week. I'll be back with another episode. Do not know what I'm going to talk about, but I will be here. And remember, as always, this is the way. You can it in. And this is where your story begins. You got the feeling that you're going to win. Yeah, you're doing fine. Now in the city and you're living fast. No looking back or dwelling on the past. You know you'll never get another chance.